Tonight on Dispatches, we show how school students brokered weapons around the world. We're moving these guns to Angola. They broke a thumb cuffs. It's a torture method. A sting stick. An electroshock baton. And import a lethal weapon. All legally brokered by teenagers. I'm an arms dealer. They smelt a bit of money and, and they didn't care what our company was like or who we were. I will go out and I will find those guns, I will buy them and then I will sell them on. If they had stricter rules, then this wouldn't have happened. September 2005, the London Arms Fair. This is the gathering of the arms industry. What's ultra frag? From the biggest multinational to the more trotter trading types, they are all here with one purpose, okay. to line up clients and flog guns. This is, a, 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 this is an anti-tank grenade. Roughly half a million people a year are killed around the world with small arms. Everything from pistols to grenades. That's one a minute. There are 640 million guns in circulation, and we add to that figure by 8 million each year. You've got a stress grenade. Yeah. Are you giving the stress grenades away? Could I have a stress grenade? They're Gucci items okay. uh, on the black market. What a fantastic way to describe it. That is quite a... And which, how far would it be? Even countries with arms embargoes, like China, come to these dudes. In 2004, the British government introduced legislation to control the arms trade and brokering. Brokering is where someone arranges an arms deal, but the goods don't actually touch the country they work from. So you could arrange a deal from Britain and the guns go direct from China to Chad, for example. Unfortunately, that legislation isn't working. And tonight in Dispatches, we reveal the loopholes in arms control. Meet the after-school arms clubs, Williams Defence and Schochter Associates, average age 16. With the help of their teachers, Mr Lear and Sister Barbara, they broker arms all around the world. Hi, I'm Ellie, I'm 15 and I'm an arms broker I special and I specialise in tanks. Hi, I'm Michaela Herbert, I'm 16, I'm an arms broker and I specialise in shotguns and missiles. Hi, I'm Tim, I'm 15 and I'm in charge of customer relations for Williams Defence. Together, we set out to explore Europe's arms controls. Who wants to go for the tank? I'll go for the tank. You're going to go for the tank, OK. <laughs> Hello, um, I'm calling to ask about a TR85M1 tank. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, thank you thank very you. much. Bye bye. Bye bye. Fantastic, you're in the tank business. <laughs> Along with the arms brokering, the students filmed their experiences to make this documentary and kickstart European governments into action. As I wanted the students to get a sense of the world they were entering into, I brought along an arms dealer to meet them. After School Arms Club, step one, network with other brokers. I know you guys have got questions to ask, but I think it might be helpful if, if Mick explained what it is you do. I'm an arms dealer. I, when somebody comes to me and says they want 20,000 M16s or something like that, I will go out and I will find those guns, I will buy them and then I will sell them on. How did you get into the arms trade? Purely by accident. Purely by accident. You, you, don't, you don't see it at the job centre. Um, no, just a, a liking, a liking of guns, which turned into, which started off as a, a basic gun dealership, which obviously turned into business in the defence industry. I've got some documentation here from uh, the, about the exports in Albania, and it says there's one to Imperial Defence Services. It had three million cartridge belts uh, twice, and then. Uh, 200 machine guns and 300,000 cartridge belts again. Is that like a typical order? Yeah, sure. That was, that was stuff that we bought to the UK. There was anti-tank guns. They were then exported to Canada. And I don't know where the other ones went to. What countries do you, do you work out of? 
we've got offices in, in, in many countries around the world. So, you know, if I name them, it'd be quite, quite a few. Well, they're not named them, but we have, we have got offices in quite a few countries. Do you detach yourself from where you send your weapons? And do you think of the effects? You've got to stand back and let somebody else make the decision. You're, you're getting documentation, you send it to an authority, be it in England, be it in Australia, be it the USA, whoever's exporting the weapons, and they decide whether the end user that you're presenting to them is acceptable or not. You said you've been in the trade 25 years. How many deals have you done over that time? Oh, countless, countless. <laughs> I wouldn't like to hazard a guess. We've certainly moved, I suppose, pushing 100,000 small arms regardless of um, what other stuff we've done, but that will give you some idea. But um, I've got the number of deals, you know, it's impossible to say. All that you need to be an arms dealer is a mobile phone, an internet address, you don't even need an office, you can make do with a postal address. After School Arms Club, step two, get brokering. And at Williams Defence, that's exactly what they did. Hi, I'm Ed Beale, a.k.a. Ed Durker, and I'm a manager and director of Williams Defence. I went to Williams Defence head office to help them with their first deal. You're going to be the boss. So you're going to be Ed Durker. You can do the call. Good afternoon. I wonder if I could speak to someone on the sales team. Lunch at the moment. Can I help you all take a message? Um, well, we have. I wonder if you might be able to help. Um, I've got an inquiry here. In fact, I've, I've just got my boss coming. I wonder if I can pass you over to Ed Durker. Okay. Uh, it's Ed Durker from Direct Deals. Di uh, sorry, Defence Deals Direct. Okay. Hello. Hello, Megan. Help you. Uh, hi. Yeah, we're a new company. We're just wondering that trying to find some handcuffs for uh, Egypt. And we wondered whether we'd have to have a licence for it. Uh, OK. Where about are you? Uh, we're in... Uh, London. London. Just bear with me. Just one moment. Put me on hold. <laughs> Hello, is it for export you need it for? Yes, uh, please. Yes, for export. Hold on. And your name is? Uh, Ed Durker. Ed Durker. D-U... D-U-R-K-A. OK. OK, then. Somebody will give you a ring after two o'clock and we'll find out for you. OK. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Well done. <laughs> Over the next few weeks, Williams Defence contacted dozens of suppliers, brokering items not covered by UK export controls. This is the wolf stick. It's a torture method. We found a brokering company. Yes, sir. Yeah. Interrogation chair with accessories. Hello, do you speak English? And I was just looking to buy some pump action shotguns. Williams Defence also discovered some EU countries had no brokering laws where they could even broker small arms, like shotguns. I was really shocked. I never thought that we'd go as far as this. Guns from Eastern Europe to Liberia. So we've got interrogation foot warmer, an interrogation chair. And eventually the burned soles of your feet away. A steel sting stick. I emailed the Chinese company to get the sting stick. We have a client who has expressed an interest in purchasing some of your equipment for a private security force in West Africa. Importing to a fictitious client in the UK, the students soon got to see the goods they shifted. Item one, thumb cuffs. Thumb cuffs moved from Taiwan to a client in the UK. I was asked along to the Common Select Committee that, amongst other things, looks at the UK military list. This, quite simply, is the list of military equipment that requires a licence for export. While I was there, I took the opportunity of showing them the thumb cuffs. As the military list lists equipment item by item, it causes as many problems as it solves. It can never cover everything. Therefore, items that could be used for torture and are not on the list can be legally brokered anywhere in the world without a licence. What's required is a catch-all clause that restricts anything that could be used for torture. Uh, this group of students are in the room here I've been working with. They, uh, they're part of an amnesty group at an Oxford school. Um, and we've been working together on some of the items that 
are included on the list or not. And these aren't. These are uh, what we managed to, to get hold of. Can Mr Thomas pass these? Very quickly, so Sir John's coming in a minute. I would urge members of the committee not to play with them. <laughs> these are not included on the current list. Um, wall cuffs are not included on the current list. Sting sticks, which are made in China, which are about this big. They're a metal rod with barbs all around them. There is no earthly reason other to do severe damage with them uh, for these things to exist. It is perfectly legal for me to go and broker, indeed the students, to go and broker these things. I think that's incredible. Sting stick, brokered from China to California. This was ordered by Oxford school children from a place in China, and on the side of the package, it looks like it says Hong Kong, and it was sent to Williams Defense, care of me in Albion, California. At any rate, there are a total of 13 of these little pointy metal objects drilled through a piece of metal in the middle, so 26 points that could hurt somebody. It looks like a medieval weapon. Having been brokered to Doug in California, the sting stick was then imported to Williams' defence. You would not believe this, guys. I can't... I'm just shocked looking at it. There is only one thing that that can be used for, isn't there? So sharp. Seriously. It's actually shocked me. Is it shocked you looking at it? That is a real weapon of torture, yet it's not on the torture list. And the message we want to send to MPs is, we've got to get stuff like this on there, haven't we? Even without the spikes, I mean, it's oh, going to hurt that's anyway. That's really, really heavy. That's just horrible. Don't drop it. No, you can feel how heavy it is. I think it would be nasty, you just can't tear well, I think it's a bad idea. I think it's absolutely stupid that kids at a school can get their hands on something as lethal as this... But, I mean, at the end of the day, we have, and this is why the laws need to be tightened. I just can't see how anyone would even design it, let alone, like, use it on anyone. Mm. Can't be justified doing it. And the fact that we've got it as kids in a hand, it shows how it can be got, which is just sick. Yeah. We're all now on the motorway going towards London, basically to present our findings before MPs in London. Obviously, we can't film inside the House of Parliament because of all the regulations, but we're going to show them what we've been able to do and hopefully just make them realise how horrendous it is that a bunch of teenagers have been able to broker on sting sticks and ball cuffs and thumb screws, it's things that are, which are only used for torture. We've been able to get hold of them so easily. Malcolm Wicks is the minister who is in charge of arms export licensing. The, the students would like to, to show you what they've what they've managed to procure, first of all. Yeah. If, if they... And tell me how you got it as well. This is the first lot, which is from Poland. Wall cuffs moved from Poland to London. These are, these are wall cuffs, as you can see. These are designed purely and simply so that you can attach someone to the wall. You could actually sell it to uh, Uzbekistan, for example, yeah. because handcuffs aren't a licensed... No. Uh, item and so that stuff would go straight under the radar. Completely unable to do well, except to certain regimes, yes, but yeah. that wouldn't. No, that wouldn't no, come no, under no, at all. That, that isn't on the export list, the military list, list at all. This is the sting stick. If I can open the sting up, it is the bizarre thing about this. I should point out is that the the police have actually said, look, you know, if you get this out too much, we we can't give you permission yeah. to wave this thing around because it's a, an offensive weapon if you it, or it could be deemed an offensive weapon if um, if you decide to rush around the tube with it yeah but this is what it is and you can see this is this is not something if you have a look feel how heavy that yeah. is I'm trying to get me arrested isn't it <laughs> <laughs> oh I, I mean basically that stuff is do you remember where it was used Tibet. it was Tibet, used yeah. in Tibet China. Uh, it's been used it's been bought in Cambodia uh, it's been deployed in Nepal. So you bought it from where? Tell me again. China. Well, from China. It's from China. China. USA. Mm. And that went from China to the US to and us. then back into England. Well, I mean, I think you've identified loopholes that clearly ought to be mm. plugged as soon as possible. Well, what guarantee can you give us that uh, the laws will be tightened on, like, all this kind of stuff? We can't give well, a guarantee can't, because, because we're we all don't... Our committee, our committee don't... don't make the laws, we, we, we scrutinise what the government does and then try and persuade them to 
change the laws. When we produce a report, yeah. the government has to respond in a certain period of time. Um, but you doing this sort of thing helps us in our job, to be honest. So what did you guys think of today? I think it went really well. It went really well, yeah. I really think we achieved something worthwhile that, you know, might actually change. It might actually change, you know, the arms laws and do something about the legislation. Not every day a group of school children get to broker a load of stuff off the police and security equipment and uh, move it around the world and then turn around to a British minister and say, here it is, you should do something about it. Cause kids with guns, kids with guns. Coming up, at our Irish school, Sister Barbara and the convent girls get stuck into the world of arms dealing. Six hundred egg-sized swords per minute. Tell Anna with non fatally think that'll kill you. And get hold of one of the weirdest bits of military equipment in the world. Williams Defence in Oxford have already brokered thumb cuffs, wall cuffs and a sting stick, all potential torture tools and not controlled by UK brokering law. The European Union decided to get to grips with arms brokering and in 2003 they announced a common position, forcing all members to introduce laws on brokerage. Ireland has not done that. And it's here in Ireland that we've set up our second After School Arms Club. After School Arms Club, step three, anything goes in Ireland. The UK has brokerage laws, albeit with loopholes. Ireland, on the other hand, has still not adopted any of the EU common position requirements regarding the brokering of arms. Sister Barbara and her pupils run a human rights group and wanted to set up an after-school arms club to highlight their government's failings. I'm Sister Barbara and a teacher and the CEO of Schachter Associates. Hi, I'm Margaret. I'm 17 years old and I'm the marketing director of Schachter Associates. Hi, I'm Maeve. I'm 18 years old and I'm financial director of Schachter Associates. Hi, I'm Laura. I'm 18 and I'm weapons specialist with Schachter Associates. Like Williams Defence, they hit the websites and got brokering. OK, we're going to look up submachine guns. OK, now I just have to type in the email address. Hello? Oh, hello? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? We want to buy our Uzi pistol. These are the AK-47. We are going to buy a Tech-9 semi-automatic pistol. Assault helicopters. We try assault helicopters and see yeah. what happens. And we are going to buy a .38 calibre revolver. This is an auto grenade launcher. Are we happy? Yeah. Happy, I like it. Sight rate, easy aiming, simple handling and maintenance, sighting device. I'm just amazed at what's going on. They never asked questions, what age you were, anything about our company. They're handcuff and leg iron. Oh! Connected with a chain. It's like, you know the way you see in the films with the slave thing, is when they have the yoke around the legs, mm. and they have the yoke around the hands, and it's just like the chain, and they can't walk. Oh, and the two, uh, your leg in your hand. Yeah, and you can't walk, and you're like this, basically, and you can't walk. We're getting ready to emails or to ring the South Africa. And we were in contact with you about the purchase of leg cuffs. Just one moment. Oh, yes, sorry, it's reminder. Yes, that's right. Thank you. Yes, bye. <laughs> so easy to be done and so easy to get these things. There you go. Just unbelievable. One company actually asked us, would we like to be an agent for their company in Ireland? So. Amnesty, along with human rights NGO AFRI, brief the girls on the brokering situation in Ireland. Ireland does have an arms trade. It's worth five billion a year. At the moment, the controls are not in place. Uh, so and we need to send out that message very clearly. And most people will be shocked. Ireland, in fact, has no legislation at all to control the activities of arms brokers. So even if your office is across the road from Dáil Éireann, and every single member of Dáil Éireann knows what you're doing, they can't touch you because you're not breaking any law. Nobody expects anybody yeah. in Ireland, no, to, be, Ireland. You know, to have anything to do with arms because we're such a neutral country. Yeah. Like the Oxford students, the convent girls filmed their investigation to make this documentary and put pressure on the Irish government to introduce brokering laws. Yes. Back at HQ, the convent girls have found a bizarre and potentially lethal device. 
600 egg sized stones per minute. <laughs> Tell Anna with non fatally think that'll kill you. Oh, it looks so small and defensive. Kind of looks like the, the tennis ball. It looks like something you'd make pasta with yeah. or something. Yeah, it looks like a kitchen <laughs> thing. Oh. Thanks to its control design, anyone struck by a stone will be hurt. Even stunned. <laughs> stunned. <laughs> but not fatally injured. If you got one across this temple, you'd be fatally injured. Um, Working with the girls, we decided to try and import the stone thrower. At £5,000, this would be the most ambitious item the programme had attempted to move. Stone thrower, moved from Israel to Ireland. Sister Barbara and I used hidden cameras to capture the dealer and his wife, who had offered to come to Ireland to demonstrate the machine, which, they told us, had already been used by the Israeli military. Working with the girls, we decided to try and import the stone thrower. This would be the most ambitious item the programme had attempted to move. The Israeli dealer decided to pass it off as agricultural equipment and they have sold us this, which is the stone thrower. Their paperwork says um, that it's a manure dispersal unit for agricultural use, and this one here, again, manure dispersal unit, item for display, for demonstration only. Now, a bit naughty because it's clearly military equipment. So we've got to try and find out how they got it into the country, did they bother getting a licence, which we don't think they did, uh, we've got to try and find out, is this a normal route that they use, the agricultural uh, usage, is that a normal thing? Um, and uh, is it lethal? Those are the big things we've got to find out. A comedian and a nun might not make for the most convincing arms dealers, but we gave it our best shot. How lovely to see you. This is Barbara, who is one of our... Barbara's our co-MD. From a hidden vantage point, the board of Schochter Associates observed the demonstration waiting to break cover and confront the dealer. This is Will, who's my nephew. Hiya, pleased to meet you. When the man and woman came, we, we were so nervous. Well, let's go. Let's go. <laughs> we just sat there, we, we were t talking to ourselves, poor Sister Barbara down in the field at Mark and Will, and we were praying that they wouldn't turn the stone thrower on. The girls were wired into the conversation. They needed to know exactly what the pellets had to say. We were all uh, up in a room and we were so scared like that something was going to happen to Sister Barbara or to Mark. Or it really was it was scary now. Did you have much trouble with the... Um, with Because I saw it was agricultural. Uh, we, we didn't want them to ask too many questions and then we have a special permit for one... For once, will, you will... And the custom, did you have any difficulties? No, no. So, so it's the same. So do you, what, did you have a permit? No, no. So you didn't get we it? We just send it like this. Without a licence? Without licence. OK, OK. I think this could be very good. Oh. I'm very excited about this. Barbara? Uh, yes. Oh, do you have a good feeling about yeah. it? Yeah, I think it's going to Let's have a look. Let's have a look. Yeah. Here we go. <laughs> you, you, wow, it's very good, yes. I imagine you only need to use this thing a couple of times. Yes. And people get the idea. Exactly. So you, this is, you use it once, maybe twice, yes. they know you've got it. Yes, for warning. It's more warning yeah. than to, to hurt them. Could it kill them if they got in them? No, uh, no. this no, is for not kill. Yeah. No. But if they were at 10 yards... It depends where you no, get not, the uh, stone. If you got in the way of it, if I, if, I, if I was... If I got in front of this thing and was here, and that hit me... Ah, oh, if you stay here, I kill you. <laughs> so if yeah. I'm... Wh how far is it? To li what, what? 10, uh, 12 uh, meter. After 12 meter, if it's not coming here like Goliath, yeah. it's not killed. Could I say to you, we have an order because you've said you don't. You, that, that we didn't get a license mm -hmm. for this. Mm -hmm. Does that mean that we we could export 
and use the term agricultural equipment to wherever we were exporting to? Uh, I think it's, yes, it's the same way we did with this. OK. Because, obviously, some destinations are sensitive yes. destinations. Yes. You, you could also uh, tell, uh, give the same reason, that it's for agricultural uh, purposes. So if we had a destination in West Africa yes. that was sensitive, mm -hmm. there wouldn't be a problem from your end? Uh, no, I, no. I just need to know if something is going to a sensitive destination, mm -hmm. whether we can, between us, mm -hmm. say, this is agricultural yes. equipment, and, and just move it straight through. Maybe another colour. If it wasn't green... Yes. So if it wasn't an army green, yes. we could put it into a, a silver or a... Yes, yes. That would be very helpful. Be... Can I try this? Sure, you must try. I take... I turn this on. Yes. OK. And then this... And then... I had just fired 200, maybe 300 stones in 20 so seconds. Way, of course, of course, of course. Can I just have a, I want to just have a look and see what the... Just a minute, you want to look? I want to look at what's happened get... on the oh, targets. They would have got that. I think we've caught them here as well. That's yes, very good, yeah, yeah. No, this is very good. That's very good. Can I... What I want to try and do... Can we? I want to see what these are like here. Can we put those here? Okay, okay. I need to make an assessment of it at, at close range as well. Okay. That's very good. Very high. Yeah, yeah. No, I understand it. Now that's that's interesting. I think it's a, it's an amazing machine. Uh, I, I'm very very impressed with it. <laughs> Uh, I think I think you should meet the rest of the company. When we walked out, we had to all hold hands. We were so nervous. It was just a rush, you know. We thought all this work was coming was coming to a head. When we walked out, we were all like holding hands, and we got to finally meet someone and ask him, like, why he was doing this, or like, what was he getting out of it? Like, and it was it was really was, and it was scary. Stop this. No, 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 no. <laughs> oh, do you want to fire it? Yeah, I can stop it. The, these girls here have been running an, a, a company. This is their equipment. Okay. This is, these, these are the people yeah. who bought this. We were looking at how police and security equipment yes. is brokered and moved around the world. Uh -huh. They were very interested in this because as... as young people, they were very interested that this was being used on young people. Girls, have you got any questions that you wanted? Did you see this machine going? Mm. How can you say it's not going to kill someone? We just saw it knock no, someone down. She said, how, how, how do you know? How can you say it won't kill someone? Ah, hi. How are you? Tell him I cannot tell him. It has the capacity to kill somebody. This isn't agricultural equipment. Yeah. It is police and security equipment, isn't it? It can shoot everything. Not uh, only stone. How can he say that it doesn't kill people when he just said that it was fatal at 12 metres and he turned around and said, oh, well, you could use it for seats at a festival and you're like, happy Halloween, like, stone tour full of seats. If you put inside the, here, sukariot, they call it sukariot? Sweets. Sweet? Is, uh, can shoot sweet. <laughs> if you put why, here... Why, who would put sweets in, into... Here, yeah, bring sweet, I'll show you. No, 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 I I ah, why? We understand. I, I'll tell you why. In Israel is uh, working with this, why this is not kill nobody. Instead it's better to shoot the person. I, I, uh, I put here a stone now, go be there. I want to, uh, I want to see what you do. <laughs> OK? You go, you go, and you're not coming here. Can I ask you one question before you? No. Okay, I don't in that answer case... you nothing now. OK, OK. Talk with you. You're not honest person. He's just angry, and, and, and if I was in his position, I'd be angry too. Sweets of uh, Halloween. What's he trying to do? Scare the kids away. It is. It is slightly nuts to say that the to suggest that the Israeli army 
would fire sweets at Palestinians. We left the Peleds contemplating if they might label their next export of the stone thrower as confectionery equipment. What would your message be then to, to the Irish authorities? But if that's Look not considered yeah. into the country. If that's not considered a weapon, what is? Like yeah. if that's if you know, if that's I don't understand. Like that it has the potential to kill someone, therefore it's a weapon and why isn't that on the list as well? Like it, it's crazy. This is Northern Ireland here. This is Coming up, the boys from Oxford go to Ireland to broker guns. We're moving these guns to Angola. That was very good. Yeah. <laughs> the Oxford girls go to Italy in search of some even bigger kit. Uh, exports on weapons or traffic? Weapons. While Sister Barbara and the convent girls blow their cover. So far, our after-school arms club investigation into the arms trade has taken us to an international arms fair, have a, look. a meeting with a minister, Cambodia, uh... and an undercover arms deal. Along the way, we've moved thumb cuffs, wall cuffs, sting sticks, and a stone thrower. This bit of the road is in Northern Ireland, and we're bound by British law. If we step over here, we're in Ireland. Let's do some arms deals. Now we up the stakes and see how some destinations offer the chance of even bigger deals. And the PM1 Forest Guard gun. After school arms club. Step four, broker abroad and get away with it. First destination, Italy. Ellie and Michaela from Williams Defence were on their first international arms trip. Our mission, to exploit a loophole that frees you from the UK law and deal in weapons if you leave British shores. We've come to Italy because in Italy there are no brokerage laws and as there are no laws about UK citizens working outside the UK on small arms like machine guns and things, that means that our Oxford students can come along and become arms dealers and brokers completely legally here in Italy. It's crazy that, you know, we can just hop on a plane and do this. Yes, yeah, so if we can do it, just think of, imagine about the people who have far more power, what they can do. What do you think about getting some of those from Pakistan? <laughs> um, these are, uh, these are rocket-propelled grenades. Um, they got, it's the Airburst Anti-Personnel Rocket. Shall I say who I am? Yeah. There are five European Union countries with no brokerage laws whatsoever. They are Ireland, Cyprus, Portugal, Greece and Luxembourg. Some quotes for Airburst anti-personal rockets. Italy's legal situation falls somewhere between lax and ambiguous. Do you want to get some shotguns? Yeah. Yeah? OK. There's no way you go popping quail out of the sky with this stuff. Uh, this is an anti-riot shotgun. It's from South Africa, um, and we're going to try and get a quote for 40 of these, I think. Good day. Hello. Um, can I that, help you? Can I speak to someone in sales and exports? Uh, exports on weapons or traffic? Weapons. One moment, please. If we were to do these deals from the UK without a licence, we would be breaking the law. The fact that we can jump on a plane and do them legally from the continent is both the fault of the countries without brokerage laws and the UK. Pump action shotguns. These are part of. Oh, look at that. Anti tank and incendiary grenades. You want a tank? Oh, that's it. Hello, um, I'm calling to ask about a TR85M1 tank. Is this the right place to... Is this the right person to talk to? Uh, can you repeat what, what type of tank? TR85M1 tank. Uh, yes, but we are... Uh, uh, OK, you are asking about some price or what do you want um, to ask? Uh, yeah, a price. We'll do all our best to reply you very quickly. Thank you, thank you thank very you. much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Fantastic. You're in the tank business. <laughs> so, that's great. He said, well, that was fantastic, because he, you said, I want to speak about a tank. And he said, what, do you want a price? 
While in Italy, we took the opportunity to speak to a local state prosecutor about an interesting case involving a big-time arms broker. So the guy we're going to go and see is uh, Mr Mapelli, who is uh, a magistrate, um, a, oh, a state prosecutor. He was the person who basically was uh, in charge of bringing a case against a guy called Leonard Minin, who was found to be uh, brokering guns to all sorts of places like Liberia, Sierra Leone, we think uh, Congo, we'll find that out. Um, and basically the Italian authorities caught him, they caught, they caught him red-handed, put him in jail and couldn't do anything because there was, there was no law to prosecute him um, under. Minim was caught in Italy with evidence connecting him to the breaking of UN arms embargoes in Liberia and Sierra Leone something he himself confessed to. But because none of the deals were done in Italy and the countries he operated from had no brokerage laws, he never faced charges. So like us, via a simple hop over the border, the law didn't follow the broker. We were wondering how you came to find out about the case Le Leonard Minin, how you found him. The police uh, found uh, cocaine in... Uh, his room, and uh, he had offered a uh, drug to, the, to some uh, uh, girls that, uh, who kept him company. Policemen found uh, a bag with uh, a lot of documents in Russian and English language. Can you tell us why uh, Minin's case was Disregarded. It is not uh, punishable, punishable um, because there is not an interest of uh, uh, Italian uh, of, of Italy to the punition of this uh, crime, and overall because uh, the rules uh, in, in 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 the in, in the countries are uh, different uh, each other. Usually you do not get the evidence in our street. And this time we got evidence which you never get. The girls had gone as far as they could in Italy, so they handed the baton over to the boys. Their destination? Ireland. A country we know is totally free of brokering controls. This is the edge. This is Northern Ireland here. This is Ireland here. Literally, where you see this tarmac change is where it changes country. Step over. We we'll step into Ireland. We're completely legal now. We can do all sorts of things that we wouldn't be able to do in Britain just because we stepped over that line. We've got your um, uh, 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 email with the price for the HS2000 pistols. Mr. Lee, it's Vladimir Vukovic. Hi, yeah. Hi. Hi, um, I've just been having a meeting with my client, and he's very pleased about the uh, prices for the HS2000s. OK. Uh, I just wanted to finalise some details. Um, do you know whether there'd be any problem with the government in Angola? I think everything we did, we basically succeeded in. We're moving these guns to Angola. We had a bit of trouble with getting certain weapons. I've got, got to run off to my meet, meeting again. I'll just pass you over to my secretary. My name is Mark Thomas. I'm the secretary for George Lear from Williams Defence. Um, you very kindly provided us with a quote uh, for the Neostead 12 bore pump action shotgun. I've got a new client here interested in shotguns for Israel, West Bank. I think we might have a problem because uh, we will, uh, it's going to be pro a problem for us to get an export permit for Israel. So do you think I'd easily be able to send it to a country nearby? Yes, I, you know, we would have to talk about it. I know that, you know, we, might, we have a distributor, say, in, in, uh, in Switzerland or so, something like that, you know, maybe that is possible. All right. That was very good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well done. So we got quite good at just playing, playing the game, really. Just down the road at Port Leash, the convent girls were very close to securing a deal on an electro-shock baton. 
a weapon included on the UK military list as torture equipment, so completely illegal for any UK citizen to broker, but perfectly OK for Irish convent girls to buy. I was sitting beside Sister Ira and it was kettles. Yeah. And, like, washing, machine, washing, washing machines, machines and, like, dishwashers and next thing, stun buttons. Yeah. Besides, <laughs> it was just ironic that these companies sell kettles, they sell washing machines, <laughs> next thing, stun buttons. <laughs> and it, was just, it just didn't, didn't add up, it didn't make sense. Like. Hello? Yeah. Hi, um, my name is Mary Rose. I'm financial assistant to Hugh Masterson of Shopter Associates. Um, I'm just wondering, could we speak to someone regarding our transaction we made? Okay, so you can you can talk to me. Oh, we got one. Did you? Yeah. One stun button is seven dollars something. I can't remember what the, what the price was. But if you wanted to buy one sample, it was twenty dollars because you're not buying a large quantity of them. You have to. It's, it's, the cheap, price it's cheaper to buy in both. Yeah. Stun button, brokered by Shopter Associates from Korea to human rights campaigner Doug Nunn in California. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Have a good day. I appreciate it. Hi, my name's Doug Nunn, and I just received this today, a few moments ago, from Korea in the mail. Hello? And it was mailed to Seach Tar Associates at my address in Albion, California. Is this Sister Barbara and the girls? As repeat firing for longer durations can damage unit and void the warranty. I received the, um, the baton. Oh, yeah, that's great. Really? Right here, the Stunmaster Stun Baton says it's 20 inches long and it gives off 500,000 volts. Oh my god. 500,000? It's got two 9 volt alkaline batteries in it right now. And is it all together or is it in little bits? Do you have to put it together? <clears throat> now I'm going to turn it on. It's just strange to think that there is actual people that's out there doing it. For three to five seconds, it will cause a loss of balance and muscle control, total mental confusion and disorientation, leaving someone dazed. Wouldn't want to be on the receiving end of that one. But anyway, that's what it is. Let me show you one more time. I held the wrong part. Anyway, that'll show me. Don't hold the top of the gun. I found out the hard way. Sister Barbara and the girls called a press conference. The deals they pulled off in their after-school club had shocked the sister and her students. It was time to tell the Irish media. Now, I would like to hand over to the students who will tell us what they learned and how easy it is to become an international arms broker from a classroom in a school in Port Leash. We're an international business with a very broad range of clients. We cater for dictators, torturers and corrupt police estates. We buy our products from a variety of international suppliers who don't care if they're selling to children or where their products will end up. There is another weapon that has been very controversial in the past couple of years, not least because of the way it has been used against prisoners in Guantanamo Bay. Leg irons. Moved from South Africa to Ireland. <laughs> I don't think you'd like those in your <laughs> We email companies who sell serious weapons like grenade launchers and Uzi machine guns. But only being students, um, it obviously meant that we didn't have the sufficient funds to buy such weapons. But it was a tiny budget, so we started to consider smaller equipment. Amnesty International describe electric shock batons as the torture's tool of choice. They are classified by most countries, including Ireland, as a weapon used for humiliating and degrading treatment. In prisons from China to Turkmenistan, from Algeria to Armenia, they are used to inflict pain and force confessions from inmates. Just before Christmas, we bought one from a South Korean dealer. We had the baton sent to a friend and human rights activist in California because the US has no controls on importing stun batons. The teenage girls from Port Leash had brought the issue of arms brokering to national attention. An amazing achievement for their after-school arms club. Yes, exactly. Since the press conference, the Irish government told dispatches they are 
preparing new export control legislation, and we hope to have a bill published later this year. The new legislation will include provisions for the regulation of arms brokering activities in Ireland and by Irish citizens abroad. This will enable Ireland to fulfil its obligation under the EU Common Position on Arms Brokering and will ensure that Ireland is meeting its EU and national obligations in full. We're proud of the hard work that we've put in through the year and eventually it all paid off. Along with William's defence, the girls' adventures into the arms world had been a real eye opener. Shocking. An education. And just amazed at what's going on into just how much work actually needs to be done to control the arms trade globally. I'd say wake up, think of what you're doing to the world, think of what you're doing to other people. The government do have control over what people can broker. It's about time the government looked around to see what was going on. It's just been a, such a learning experience for me. Actions are made up of individuals. If you're part of the supply chain, you're part of the problem. It's shown me that more people do need to know about these things and that you know, something needs to be done about it. I hope this has changed something, but I'm angry that we were able to do it in the first place. I think my parents were, you know, probably thought I was joking at first, because it's not the kind of thing you come home from school and say, you know, I'm going to order a sting stick tomorrow or something. A little part of us is still sad that we could actually pull off this project, that it, it can actually be done. So what's needed? One, all European countries need brokerage laws. Two, there needs to be a catch-all clause to bring in all the military and torture equipment that's not on the list. Three, we need to have a law that stops British citizens being able to leave Britain to do deals they're not able to do here. And four, there needs to be a register of dealers and brokers. The government can decide who deals, who doesn't. If there had been a register, the students wouldn't have been able to do what they have done. Doing all this stuff actually wasn't child's play, but the solution to it is. Well, on Thursday at 9 o'clock, Dispatchers looks at how to beat your kids' asthma. Coming up next on 4, we follow three young people bravely trying to overcome their speech difficulties in Help Me to Speak.